journalist, author, TV presenter, who fronted BBC's Newsnight for 11 years, among many other news and current affairs programmes. Also stood as a candidate for Change UK in the 2019 European Parliament. Gavin, I was reading um, a review of your book in the New European. It was an extremely good review. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it yourself. And, and the guy who wrote it said, uh, the band may be playing, but it's playing on the deck of the Titanic. We were holed below the waterline a long time ago. It's just that the tipping point has now been reached. Welcome to Worldwide Wednesday from the heart of Liverpool City region, uh, Gavin, a place that some people here believe effectively declare, declared UDI from England many, <laughs> many moons ago. Um, now you say while the UK can survive Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and maybe even Scouse nationalism, you argue it won't survive English nationalism. Why is this? Well, it's, first of all, it's very good to be here and it was very good to listen to Josh. I think I, I, I learned a lot from, from that. Um, well, my, my starting point was that something very remarkable happened in 2015. We know in 2014, Scotland had a referendum on independence and it, it failed. Uh, but in 2015, the four constituent parts of the United Kingdom voted for different parties, different big parties. So the main party in Scotland is the SNP in 2015, and still is. In Northern Ireland, it was the Democratic Unionist Party. In Wales, it was the Labour Party. In England, it was the Conservative Party, because England's 84% of the population formed the government. And also 3.8 million people that year who voted UKIP got one MP, Douglas Carswell, who then quit. And I thought, this is a funny country, isn't it? I mean, at what sense, what is my sense of this being a united kingdom? How united are we when these four different parts have gone in slightly different ways? And I started looking in particular at English nationalism, which was clearly growing and was part, partly behind uh, the Brexit vote. And I started to think, what are the political consequences of this? And not only that, the United Kingdom in various names and various guises has been going since 1603 and it was reinvented every hundred years since. So in 1707, the Union of Parliaments, 1801 when Ireland joined, 1921 when Ireland left. We're now in 2021. Uh, it's due, if it's worth it, another reevaluation and reinvention because they come every hundred years, usually as a result of crises. And this one, I think is a very slow moving crisis but it is a crisis nevertheless. And if you ask historians like Linda Colley and the chap who wrote that book, uh, that review of me is James Hawes, who, who's written a great book on the history of England. They see the history of England as being, very, uh, of Britain rather, as being countries brought together by three things, originally Protestantism, then empire, and then war. And those three things have either faded or we hope with war receded completely. So what is it that holds us together apart from sentiment and nostalgia for the past? And I started to ask that question in, in Scotland uh, where uh, I started thinking about the book in really in 2019, where when I said, you know, uh, uh, Boris Johnson says he's a one nation conservative, people said, yeah, and the one nation is England. It's not, it's not the UK. <laughs> Uh, and they said other things as well, which I won't re <laughs> repeat in polite company. In Northern Ireland, uh, I was there in October 2019, three, three days at the Imagine Belfast Festival. And three days after uh, Boris Johnson threw essentially 100 years of Irish unionism, uh, Northern Ireland unionism into the Irish Sea. Um, and I, I was with, with a group of people there of different political views. But a couple of those from a unionist background said to me, you know, Mrs. Thatcher always said Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Boris Johnson's made it as British as France. Now, you can agree or disagree with these sentiments, but they were uh, held very closely. And then finally, to, to, to get to the, the point of your question, I looked at how the Conservative Party had changed. And I would say, uh, I don't use this word in his uh, same sentence as Boris Johnson very often, but his genius in co-opting the Brexit stroke UKIP vote to the Conservative Party. But when he did so, he speaks for England on that because Scotland and Northern Ireland voted a different way. And even some, uh, you know, there's a Cambridge um, uh, geographer called Danny Dorling who's done some research in Wales and suggests that those people, many of them who've, who've gone to Wales or retired in Wales from England, voted overwhelmingly to leave. Whereas those who were originally Welsh or had been there for a longer time didn't. 
So it's a, it's a mixed pattern, but the tectonic plates of our union are moving apart. And because England is the biggest player, it's England that's the most important one to think about, I think. And um, Churchill himself, you say in the book, uh, suggested in 1912 and 13 that England might turn into several great self-governing regions. How likely do you think that that idea will um, be revived and brought forward, do you think? Well, I, I know some people are thinking of, uh, about it. Uh, I've talked to a few people who have been in government and, and are interested in it. And just, just look at it from, from the perspective of England. I, I live in England. I love, love it, living in England. It is the, one of the most centralised countries in Europe. France is decentralised greatly. Uh, other countries, Germany and so on, have decentralised uh, and they've changed their structure, helped along by one or two events of the last century, obviously. Um, uh, but they changed their structure to give more and more power to local areas. Scotland, it's happened in Scotland. They've got a local parliament. It's happened in Northern Ireland. It's happened in Wales. These are, I'm not saying they're all perfect, but all three have a kind of proportional representation. So if you get 43% of the vote, you get 43% of the seats, whereas in, in, in the UK context, you get 43% of the vote, you get a landslide for, for, for the current government. Uh, and, and the big cities, Liverpool is just one of the best examples where people feel a strong sense of identity, where they're perfectly happy and competent to, to decide what's most important for Liverpool or Birmingham or Andy Burnham in, in Manchester. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting, you know, Let's have it Wessex, the kingdom of Wessex and Mercia and all that back. But it's not beyond the wit of English people who've written constitutions for 70 different countries around the world, but haven't written one for ourselves to get together and think who should be in charge of what and why should it be so centralized in Westminster? And just, just, just one, one final example on that. Do you remember when Boris Johnson got COVID? And suddenly we woke up one morning and Dominic Raab was the prime minister. At least he was doing the, the powers of, well, why? I mean, in, in America, when Trump was sick, we knew there was a vice president. We knew what the constitution says. If Merkel had got sick, we know what their basic law says. But suddenly we found, and I was listening to these very bright people on Radio 4 and the Today programme in the morning being asked, so um, what are his powers? Well, we don't exactly know. I mean, is he prime minister? Well, he's not prime minister, but I mean, could he, could he um, declare a nuclear strike on somebody? Well, he certainly wouldn't do that, but could he do it? So why have we never thought of that? Why have we never thought through uh, as other countries have done? And why do we remain politically in the kind of era of the horse and cart with all the social media that Josh has been talking about changing our politics? Um, uh, and all I really wanted to do was a kind of wake up call to say, maybe we should think about this. And is anybody thinking about it as far as you know, among our, our political establishment? It, it's been a topic that's kind of been touched on a little bit over the past 40, 50 years, but it's, it's not exactly a main vote winner, is it? No, it's not. And, and the trouble is constitutional reform, as we saw with PR, Mick, in the past, when you vote for it, people weren't really that interested. It's not a thing that immediately grabs people. But what would Im immediately grab people is this. If Scotland does vote for independence at some point, perhaps within the next decade, what, where would that leave England? Um, I mean, just, just to be brutal about it, Scotland's 30 to 2% of the land mass of the United Kingdom and 60% of the, the, of the sea areas under the usual international law, that would go. The, 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 the Faz Lane nuclear weapons would be sailing, sailing down and presumably parking off the Mersey. I mean, I have no idea where they would go and neither does anybody else. Uh, what would happen about the border? Because there would be a border and we, we, we often see it as the Scots would have a problem, they couldn't afford it and all that, all, all of which I get but it would be a real shock for England to find that a Scotland leaving the UK, joining the EU would have a, a border somewhere between, you know, Carlisle and Glasgow, I suppose. What, what would that look like? So uh, I just thought that both for nationalists in Scotland and elsewhere, what, what do you mean by it being independent in an interdependent world? But for those who would like the union to stay together, just think about it. It's not entirely in your hands. And, you know, George Osborne 
Conservative former Chancellor, wrote a couple of months ago that Boris Johnson risks becoming the worst Prime Minister in history, worse than Lord North, who lost the American colonies, and the only way to stop Scotland becoming independent is not letting them vote on it, which <laughs> sounds a bit like defeatism to me. I mean, it's not really a great case for, for the Union. So that, that, that's really what inspired the book. We got a, a couple of people who have sent in questions, and uh, I know we got a number of people listening in Wales. And I'm also I'm particularly interested in where you think Wales is going in all this. Will the Welsh, in inverted commas, stick with the English, close inverted commas, as it were, or will nationalism grow there in a similar way to Scotland? Well, it, it already has. Uh, you know, yes, Cymru uh, saying they've had much more interest. I'm not quite sure of the figures. So there's cert certainly that from those uh, like Ply Cymru and others who, who would like to uh, push for independence. I think that would have problems, but any kind of breakup or change would, would have problems. I, I was particularly interested in what Mark Drakeford, the, the first minister of Wales said, you know, Labour Party guy in favour of the union, he says, the union as it's currently constructed is broken. And he says, and he puts it more articulately than I'm gonna do, you know, that Westminster only doesn't really consult us, just doesn't treat us right. And, and, and that is unbalancing. Now, if you're getting that from people of a unionist disposition in Wales, you can imagine what people for various reasons who are already in favor of Welsh independence uh, are, are stirred up by it. And, and Boris Johnson is probably the, the worst prime minister possible for this time because he doesn't travel very well you know <laughs> you know no, no, no. When, when he went when, when, when he when he was his government was elected he decided to have an away day in Sunderland to show how together England really is and it was slightly spoiled by Sajid Javid tweeting it's great to be here in North England <laughs> great <laughs> what can yeah. I say what can you say yeah, yeah I mean if we do move towards a more federalist idea a more federalist structure John Major was quoted in, in one of the interviews, I think I heard you give, uh, um, and he said that um, if the answer is more politicians, then you've got the question wrong. Mm -hmm. well, that, that, that may be correct. And so I, I'd be quite in favour of fewer politicians, but the ones I'd be prepared to see go would be those in the House of Lords, all 800 and whatever it is of them, in the, you know, the biggest debating chamber outside communist China. Uh, I just think we could... We could actually, I mean, look, uh, there's so many good things about this country. We have got brilliant people, more Nobel Prize winners attached to one university, Cambridge, than all of China and Japan put together. We solve problems, we invent things. And yet we have got a really cat handed ludicrous system uh, where I think we're the only country in Europe that has got an upper chamber. We are the only country in Europe that's got an upper chamber, which is composed of people, some of whom are appointed, some of whom are hereditary, uh, and, and some of whom are very good, by the way, but it's still a nutty system to have. Uh, and and it, it requires root and branch reform. And the one other thing I would say is that we've already federalized sort of by stealth. You know, there are four chief medical officers in the United Kingdom, one for Northern Ireland, one for Scotland, one for Wales, and one for England. Um, the, the NHS is quite locally devolved. It's a bit more complicated in England because it was reformed. I use the word loosely by Andrew Lansley a few years ago and it, the reforms weren't all that good. So we, we've, we've got a structure that we could build on if we had the wit to kind of basically codify it and say who should do what. And in terms of moving back towards the, the federalist idea, do you think the likes of Andy Burnham and people like that who've got a high profile nationally, not just regionally, um, would buy into some of the thoughts that you've been uh, talking about today? I, I think so. I mean, I, I really strongly believe that, uh, you know, uh, local, as many decisions as possible should be taken by local people who, who identify with Liverpool or Greater Manchester or, or, or whatever. It, it just seems to work and it works in other, other places. I mean, Switzerland has got, has got four different languages. Uh, the, the, the biggest one's German, about 70% of the population. So kind of like very different in many other ways, but it's got a, a split kind of like the biggest part of our country is England with a, a 
Scotland next, Wales next, Northern Ireland smallest. And they just, they just have a confederal system where they have a central government, but most other things are devolved. We could do that. We're not, we're not stupid. And it, it would perhaps get rid of some of these, these problems. Now, I'm not, I don't think I've got all the answers, but I think we mm. probably can agree that the system as it is now is not really working very well. You argue that Britishness doesn't mean the same thing, say, in Scotland as Wales and Wales as it does in England. Can you just expand a little bit on that for us? Well, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm Scottish and British, but I don't confuse the two. There's a there's a, whereas quite often and for obvious reasons, since as I keep saying, England's the biggest part uh, in England, it's confused. What, one of my great favourite quotes is that great British imperialist Cecil Rhodes, who said, ask any man what he'd rather be and round the world 99% say they'd rather be English. So he's a British imperialist, but he's talking about England and and that's a, that's that's simply a confusion that people in people in in Belfast who think they're British are very clear they're not the same things people in Wales who think they're British again don't think of it as the same thing I don't it's not it's not something to get offended by but it's just something to be noted that that the the two are not quite the same and so therefore when we've got a British government in London which seems to speak only for England it starts to put a wedge between us unfortunately Yes. Um, just go into some of the comments now. We've got uh, Judith, which is kind of an observation, really, but I, th I think she'd be interested to, uh, to hear your response to it. The City of London functions as an independent Tory city state, as in medieval times, and the rest of the country, except the home countries where they live, are, let me just scroll down a bit, are of no significance at all. That's her feeling from, from, from wherever she's based. I'm not sure whether she's from around here, but. but it's, it's, it's certainly true that, I mean, London's a great city. I think it's the greatest city in Europe. It's, it's fantastic, uh, but it does have uh, the economic power and it also has the political power. And it's certainly true. I don't think it's quite true of all Londoners because, you know, uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London is a, is, is a member of the Labour Party. There's a very strong Labour vote uh, in London. But it is true that uh, sometimes when, and it's true of journalists as well, when they get outside the M25, they get a bit lost and probably, you know, would be as familiar with, uh, well, more familiar with Washington than the world, for example. Um, and that, that causes problems too, because there's, one of the things is to understand what we mean by we because we mean we in different places. We can mean that we are British, or we can mean we're English, or we can mean we're from Lancashire, whatever it is. Uh, we've got different, different levels of identity. One of the many problems with Brexit is it's forced us to think slightly differently about that, especially since Scotland and Northern Ireland were taken out of, of the EU against their will. So uh, it's never been, Northern Ireland's another good example. The great thing about the Good Friday Agreement, which is now in a degree of difficulty, is that if you are of a unionist background in Northern Ireland, you've still got the border, it's on the map. If you're of a nationalist uh, background in Northern Ireland, yeah, it's on the map, but it doesn't actually matter. It was a brilliant, brilliant way of bringing people together. And now that's in jeopardy because of carelessness uh, or in incompetence, actually, from the Johnson government. We've had another comment here. Thanks for that answer there, uh, Gavin, from Louise Alman, who's one of our former mm. MPs, Liverpool Riverside MP for, for many years, on regionalism. She says the 1997 Labour government moved forward on regionalism through regional development agencies, but was not serious about devolving further powers. More recently, the various city deals bring devolution, but fragmentation. And that kind of granular information is important in all this isn't it we can't just have a vision we've got to get something that works properly yeah or at least I, we move I, I agree i agree with louise elman and, and entirely there and and part of it is there is a delusion in our country that we've sort of muddled through you know that you don't take decisions you don't write write down on a one piece of paper who does what and call it a constitution we don't do that we just sort of muddle through we don't muddle through in 1921, Ireland left the United Kingdom as a result of a really horrific war, and not just World War I, but as a result of the Irish War of Independence. 
we can't just muddle through. It's not good enough. And and uh, Louise Elman is, is right. Labour came in with a number of ideas, but I, I was asking somebody who's a top civil servant why we never really got proportional representation, for example, which would help with some of these problems, in, in my view. And he said, the number 179. And I said, I, I don't know what you mean. He said, that was the size of the Labour majority in 1997. And it was very difficult for Tony Blair to do something which to most people is quite boring, which to many Labour MPs would be very annoying and say, you know, that ladder up which we've just ascended after all these years, we're going to kick it away and do something else. So that is a big problem. Yes, I mean, we've had a number of comments about PR, one from Stephen Hesketh, uh, the MP, saying Lynn Barnes, uh, sorry, um, which is why we have to get PR as a top priority. I would agree with that. I would, if, you know, rather than the, the two things that I would like to see, which would, I think, help keep us together, would be to get have PR so that people feel represented, including parties that I don't particularly like. I think that's fine. I mean, there may have to be a cutoff. I'm not saying any system is, is brilliant. But the systems for Edinburgh, Belfast and Wales uh, and Cardiff are better than the system for, we for Westminster. And the other thing is, I really think that the whole question of the House of Lords is everybody knows it's a nonsense. I mean, there is no there is no uh, there is no great support for it. The only reason it's still there is inertia. And also, if the if the people in the House of Lords wanted to uh, this is this is not being nasty about any individuals, because I know some really hard working Peers. Yes. But yeah. if they if they want a club in London, well, they should pay for it. Frankly, I would I would sell um, peerages just as long as it's open. Put them on the open market. If somebody wants to call themselves Lord, just don't let them be involved in making laws for this country. But people have been. I mean, I can remember <laughs> when I was a kid in the seventies, yeah. people saying that, and it just seems to be one of these things that floats in and out of the, uh, the political landscape without anyone, you know, kind of grabbing hold of, doesn't it? You know. Yeah, I know, I know. But anyway, there we are. <laughs> uh, 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 the, the, point, the point is this, that we are at a kind of turning point now, what with Brexit and also COVID, which should have, in some senses, has pulled us together in the sense that we're all pleased about vaccinations and so on, and most of us are anyway. Um, but you have seen that not only the three, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, have gone slightly different ways at different speeds, but Andy Burnham, Liverpool as well, people are saying, wait a minute, what Westminster was decided isn't quite right for us. And I think that's a healthy thing to say, but we should have more of it and they should have an ex a way of expressing it. Josh, do you want to join us back now? We, we have, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left. I know there are other matters that are of concern to many people in this <laughs> virtual room. Um, <laughs> Your response to anything particular that Gavin was saying, um, Josh? You're definitely speaking to something that I've, I've realised there's quite a lot of like, independent people talking about is that our system, as it functions like very broadly, doesn't really work anymore. I mean, I think that almost all of our institutions, if not all of them, have been shown basically since the Brexit vote to be useless. Um, they, they have, in my mind at least, failed in their primary objective. The press no longer holds the government to account. The judiciary seems to be weirdly sometimes like willing to take some cases, some not, and doesn't really seem, we don't really know what to do with it. It's become very politicised. Uh, Parliament doesn't move quickly enough, um, doesn't address the issues of the day, and doesn't really legislate in a way that benefits more than just the, the donors of the ruling party. And, and I think we're reaching a point where we need to have, and I've been talking about it with people called the big review of Britain, where we like just like literally just go through everything and, and be like, right, okay. We, the system we have has got us very far. It's brought us to one of the most prosperous, safest, most diverse countries in the world. That's really awesome. We've done loads of amazing things with it, but that doesn't mean it's it's wonderful and needs to sort of just be allowed to continue on. And I think there's there's an increasing um, yeah an increasing push for or there needs to be an increasing push for some sort of constitutional convention. And I know you've sort of talked about this idea with, with a few people, <laughs> um, but how do you think we get there? Because I I understand how that goes once we actually start it, 
Mm-hmm. But I, I'm really, I, I've been trying to figure out how we get to that point, like when Boris Johnson turns around and says, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> yeah, well, no, we, we have to have global Britain first, whatever that is, as if we haven't been global for 400 years. And as if, I, what, what really amuses me is, is uh, that we're, we're supposed to be global Britain having irritated Ireland, most of the EU, Russia, China, the Biden administration and every country that we don't give aid to as much as before. Um, so I, I'm not suggesting it's, it's going to be easy. But um, equally, I, I think there is, look, that, that one, of the, one of the things I quote in the book is there's a thing called the Edelman, a, a, a sort of a PR and market research company at the United States. Every year does a trust survey about what do people trust in 28 OECD countries. So the rich countries in the world. The United Kingdom, which is, you know, as I said before, and as you just said, Josh, is such a great country in so many ways, comes 27th out of 28 countries in terms of trust for government, the media, uh, NGOs, and big business. 27th out of 28. And thank goodness for Putin's Russia, because he's at the bottom. Now, that is not, not the country that any of us want to live in. We want, a, we want to live in a country where we do trust our institutions. Uh, and and I, I, I'm not sure what the roadmap is to get there. But the, what I suggest is, one, recognize the problem, as everybody on this call does, but I'm not sure it quite gets through to the government. And then uh, repair any of those institutions that we still think are valuable, of course, the NHS and, uh, and others, and then reconstruct some sense of, of why we should be together. Now, that's kind of easy to say and very, very difficult to do, but it's not impossible. And if we don't do it, the alternative is just to continue to slide the way we're doing. I mean, I think that the problem that a lot of people don't maybe, I don't know, not don't realize, but if if things keep getting worse, like, like if if uh, if wealth inequality keeps growing, if more and more people feel disenfranchised, and obviously we're not in a good place. Actually, I've heard you quote that statistic before. It's it's quite horrifying. But I mean, if we don't if we don't do something about this, we risk opening ourselves up to one or both of the parties being just subsumed or our entire like political system being taken over by the extremists who will do something and uh, that's the thing that concerns me most and it's it's like it's not that i'm more concerned about like the left or the right they're both terrifying to me in that i do not want the extremes of either one of those parties to get into power because the system collapsed and they went they can go well look the system has collapsed it's failed like let's just throw it all out and start again and that's like the, the, that's that's my biggest concern is that either one of those extremes gets hold of power and and just kind of kind of goes crazy because people are like well how can it be worse than the alternative like we have to fix the problem now <laughs> Well, we, yeah. we've had a lot of people mentioning a progressive alliance, a lot, a lot of people, that have basically the, the last six or seven messages uh, have been mentioning that. So we'll see if that happens. Look, it's time to write up, to wrap up now. Uh, Josh is the author. Josh Hamilton is the author of Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And Gavin, Gavin Esler's, Esler's book, um, How Britain Ends, is published by Head of Zeus. Many thanks to both of you for joining us today. Thanks for all your interaction you. as, as well, everybody. It's really, really appreciated. A fascinating discussion and great books. And a big thank you to you, Josh, and you, Gavin, for joining us here today. My name's Mick Ord. Great to meet you all today. I've got a couple of podcasts out. One is the Baltic Triangle podcast, which is on business and culture. And that's a Liverpool-based podcast. And I've got another one in a couple of months' time, in a couple of weeks' time, rather, with Ian Prowse, a local musician it's called misadventures in music and that'll be a lot ruder than the baltic triangle podcast but i hope you both listen to it gavin and josh thanks for joining us on worldwide wednesday